So these are uh, very short sections from uh, Barhan um, that I handed out uh, last class that pertain to the veil or pertain to cover or modesty. And there are two of the four verses that Helen Watson mentions in her article. Now, we discussed one of them, um, the one from the light, right, 24, uh, chapter 24, and the bottom page 49, right, and we talked about, uh, so that's verse, so chapter 24, Chapter 24, and starting at verse 30, this is how you play the Quran, chapter and verse. And as I mentioned, for those of you who weren't here, um, as you'll notice, it says the Quran interpreted in my copy of the Quran, and that's because technically, um, one says it's going to be accurate that the Quran is not translated, it's interpreted, because it cannot actually translate the word of God and the Quran is revealed to the prophet in Arabic. So in any other language, often you'll see interpreted instead of translated. But that also gets to the fact that how can one translate? Some of the words are very uh, and getting them completely accurate or and we discussed in, in that regard um, how this particular interpretation of arborees, which is the one that many people use in English, is uh, highly poetic, it's beautiful, um, but it is, that's, that's the emphasis, rather than getting it the technical language it sort of forsakes some of the absolute technical language for poetry. In any event, so the bottom of, the, of chapter 24, verse 30, we read um, this section that is often um, mentioned when discussing the requirement to cover. And we talked about how there is nothing particular to the hair the head. Um, it's most specifically about adornment. Right? It's most specifically about those people who, you know, specifying who are the people that you can show your adornment to. Whatever adornment means, who are the people in the family or in your relationships that you are allowed to be, they're allowed to see this adornment. We talked about um, private parts, adornment, bosoms, um, about casting down their eyes. Okay. We talked about um, the question of you know, what it meant to you know, stomp your feet. Right at the bottom it says, uh, nor let them, at the bottom, um, on the top of page 50, on the top of page 50, it says, nor let them stamp their feet so that their hidden ornament may be known and turn all together to God or you believe those acting so you will prosper. Okay. So this is one of the, the main um, chapters and verses that talk about <coughs> covering for women. And again, specifically to say to whom you don't need to cover. But you can see it's not it's not wholly specific. It's not completely specific. It doesn't say cover your hair, cover your hands. That, um, that language appears not in the Quran, but it appears in what we call the hadith, right? The second primary source for religious law, right? The first source for understanding what one should do, one should not do, is obviously the Quran. The second 
most important source is called the Hadith. And the Hadith are the sayings and doings of the Prophet. So the Prophet, what he said in his lifetime and what he is said to have encouraged people to do or not do, becomes the, he becomes the exemplary figure. And as we, I think we talked about in Islam, the figure of the prophet is completely human. Right? Um, and so there's no, there's no um, sense that this figure is somehow divine in any way. I think Christianity, there's, there's that debate. I mean, it's completely human, absolutely human. Still, the actions of the prophet are taken as completely exemplary, right? So it's not, you know, you have this, just because he's human, it does not mean that there is, um, there is doubt about his behavior, right? Is everyone following? Now, there are many different sources for understanding the Hadith. Right? There are some main texts, but um, they, uh, you know, and different scholars, different legal schools emphasize different compilations of the Hadith. Is everyone following with this? Right? So there'll be, the Hadith will say, for example, you know, so and so heard from so and so who heard from so and so who heard from so and so that. The Prophet Muhammad said X, Y, and Z, right? And there's a long list of people because that's how that's how that tradition was passed on, and then eventually written down and then compiled in these massive compendia. And you can access them online very easily today, right? Yeah. So does that mean they're written by the Prophet, or is no. this all? No, the Prophet himself uh, was illiterate. The prophet himself was illiterate, um, so he did not write anything. He was uh, so he spoke the, the words that were revealed to him, right? The, the revelations from God. He repeated to his followers and wives, and they wrote them down. And then it was eventually under the caliph Uthman. Right, remember we talked about the four rightly guided caliphs? It was under the Caliph of Men where the final compiled Quran was sort of put together, brought together, right? And sort of organized. So those revelations, he didn't write them down. He he revealed, you know, he they were revealed to him, he repeated them, other people memorized them, and then it was written down and finally compiled under the Hadith. Are again other people remembering what he did and said, and the the chain of transmission is incredibly important. So there is a you know a kind of science called the science of the transmission. So that let's say you know Mamadou says after class, I heard that Professor Lindbergh said that Helen Watson wrote, right? So here are two people between Helen Watson, but let's say Helen Watson didn't write anything, she actually just spoke it in the lecture, right? So you didn't go to the lecture, I went to the lecture. I hear Helen Watson say something, then you, and I come to class and you say to Amanda, Amanda was out that day, you say, Professor Limbert said that Helen Watson said, and then Amanda repeats it on and on. And then to <coughs> under, so that whole chain of transmission is not only compiled, but then there is an invest a kind of there was an kind of investigation into the character of each of us to make sure that we would necessarily provide accurate information. But not only that, that would it would be corroborated. So it would not be enough for Amanda to get it from Mamadou. You would have to get it from someone else too to make sure that everyone, so that particular hadith were corroborated by different people. And then the way this works is that with the various levels of corroboration and 
taking into account the character of the people who were transmitting. Right? Let's say, you know, let's say Mamadou rarely came to class. Right? And yet, and so then we say, okay, well, this transmission is a little iffy. Because he's not really here very often. Maybe in this, you know, he's not really paying attention to what's going on. Right? So his so there's like levels of what hadith are considered most sound and what hadith are less sound. Right? And people debate this over and over and over again. So somebody will say in Islamic law, this is what we should do. This is what one should do or should not do or it's recommended or not recommended or whatever category it is. And then someone will say, but that hadith that you're basing that law on is not as sound a hadith as this one. Is everyone following? So that becomes part of the debate about law. So it's not only whether it's in the Quran, but it's in the hadith, whether it's a sound hadith, and who is using it based on the characters involved. So that's just a sort of intro to Islam first part. Besides okay. after this. Alright, so the veiling, the veiling discussion, and we'll see this in the next one, is also not so much, it's not in the Quran. I mean, the veiling is there, but it's in this kind of adornment, covering, casting away language. It isn't saying, cover your hair, cover your face, any of that. It's like, modestly, cast away your eyes, keep your adornments for those who are very close to it. It's more in that hadith where that is. And that opens it up despite its um, overall presence as central to Islamic law. It also gives it, there's a little bit of an opening up for where people interpret, right? And, and someone can say, well, what it says here in the Quran is the adornment. The ornament in the bosom and in the private parts. And it's in the Hadith where it's more specifically about the hip. Okay, so, but let's read this, this Confederates section. So, um, in the Confederates, which is 33. Here we have the word veil. Okay. So at the bottom of, so on page 128, right above verse 60, here we have the word, right? This, this is a verse. I'll read it to you. O prophet, say to thy wives. So this is God speaking. To Muhammad, right? This is the this is the revelation. And so it says, O prophet, say to thy wives and daughters and the believing women. So you, your I'm God is speaking to Muhammad to speak to the women, the wives, the daughters, and the believers, that they draw their veils close to them. So it is likelier they will be known and not. God is all forgiving, all compassionate. Listen to that. Listen to this verse. What is the point of this verse? So the first verse was about hiding your adornment. Right? About casting your eyes down, not, you know, hiding private parts. Right? This one is saying something different. Let me read it again. O prophet. Say to thy wives and daughters and the believing women that they draw their veils close to them. And again, what is a veil? What does that mean? Does it mean your face? Does it mean your hair? Does it, what, what is a veil? Right? That's that's the whole point of law is to understand and interpret and <laughs> So it is likelier they will be known. And not first. What? It's the, that for the women's protection, they to cover themselves. It's a veil. Yes. 
so that other people will know that they are believers and they can do what they can do that. Is that what you're really saying? So the point here, as Helen often mentions, right, but I just wanted to emphasize it, it is very clear here what it, you know, you can say it's a little bit better. But do this that they, so it is likelier they will be known. Known for what? Uh, well, if in the context of they're speaking directly to his wives and daughters, they would be known as associated with the prophet, and prophets are usually not received very well in like larger community of like a religious order, um, so that they would be you know signaled that as connected to him directly, so they, they would be protected. But um, yeah, I think and the believing woman, so. Say to thy wives and daughters and the believing women, so it is likelier they will be known and not hurt. So known to be associated with a prophet, known as what? Right, so it becomes, so right here in the Quran, right very early, it becomes a symbol. Right, can I move now? Just press one. Okay. It's a dangerous move in the Quran, just turn it to a scratch. Um, so, right, so the, but the question here is that right here it's saying, this will, this will signify, the veil will serve as a symbol. It will signify to other people. Mahdi, you're going to have to well, I was going to ask, um, this, this, this chapter was revealed in the demon, right? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, I think so. I think the uh, Confederates was a Medina. Okay, so, yeah. so, so most likely, since, since in Medina, we are like the living community, I right. guess that's where, that's where the point of sin is. Right. So I mean, like, how it was in, I guess, in Mecca. back in Mecca, it wouldn't have been. It, it would make it as much sense. Yeah. All right. So for those of you who worked here last time, I, I emphasize and Thanks, Mary, for reminding me that but in the Quran, or remember that the community moved in 622 from Mecca to Medina. And it's that transfer that marks the beginning of the Islamic calendar, that, that move marks the beginning of the sort of formal association <coughs> building of this idea of the community, right? What's called the Ummah, the community, right? Sort of the establishment, and that's why 622 is so important in Mark City when you become a Not Muhammad's <coughs> birth, Muhammad's death, first revelation, nothing. It's a year of the movement, the establishment of the kingdom. Now, that, that given still, the Quran was revealed over both areas. And the revelations that were, the, the revelations that were revealed in Mecca are of a different tone than, as I mentioned, than the ones in Medina. The ones in Mecca are much more spiritual, more God-fearing, almost. Um, whereas the ones in Medina are much more direct, more, more practical, much more matter-of-fact. I mean, there, it's all it's poetic, but it's about practic more about the practicality of the community. All right, so that was the question. So, but what, Again, what is important here is that you see different sides in the Quran of what this covering is. It's about modesty, but it's also about signifying distinguishing difference. It's about protection. Okay, so these are the themes that one sees just in those two different in those two different verses. Okay. So I want to then now <clears throat> recognize that we have sort of in law, right, this, this emphasis in a few places in the Quran, not all over by any means, just a few places in the Quran, with emphasis to cover, to protect, etc. And the question is, okay, so what happens with that principle, that ideal, right? And 
last time we talked about how in the 19, the turn of the century, or into the middle part of the century, there was a lot of emphasis socially, politically, not to wear the gun. And, you know, it was, uh, it wasn't necessarily that everyone was wearing the head covering before. Anyway, um, but there was an impulse, nevertheless, to try to quote unquote modernize. Now, into the late 70s, and then especially into the 80s and 90s, we, had, we see a shift in, into what we call a kind of new veiling phenomenon, right? Where, and again, I'm using the word veiling lightly or vaguely, because we're not talking about face cover. We're talking about head, right? And that's why the word veil is not, is not actually very accurate, right? We're not talking about face but what we've seen is that there's, there was, in the 80s and 90s, a reemergence of women, often young universities and like you, who would take this on. All right? Um, and now I want to turn to Helen Watson's article to talk about some examples of women who decide, like, so I love this piece because it you know, focuses on several very specific examples and interviews thinking about why particular women at a certain time decide to wear the hijab. Okay, so let's take some examples. Let's start with um, Nadia, right? So this is um, a British Asian who decides at 16 to start covering her hair. Right? So she's living in England. And let me just read what she says. I just don't even remember. Here's Nadia on page 148. My choice of the veil is one of the most important personal decisions of my life. That's what she says. I was at school thinking about applying to university. I was attending a small school and felt quite at home there because all the pupils knew each other. But I had the idea that university would be very different. Huge classes and lots of people you would never get to know. In that kind of world, I felt that it was important to dress so that people would know that I was a Muslim. At that time, I was also thinking about my religion and feeling that it was the most important thing in my personal life. I had all the other usual interests of most girls my age, music and cinema, and my dream was to get high enough grades to get a place to study medicine like several of my friends. But Islam makes me different. My cultural background and my family's roots are in another part of the world. These things are very important to me and make me feel special. It is important to me not to lose those parts of my life. My decisions to wear, my decisions to wear that also ties into my feeling of coming from this kind of, this different kind of background. We are a British family, but because of Islam and our link to this kind of Islam, we have different values and traditions from the families of my non-Muslim friends. So what, do you, what is she getting at? Why is she deciding? Uh, it identifies her as a part and apart from, you know, the, it stands her out, but then it also ties her directly to her cultural past. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, you know, it's a signal to anyone that she is of this background and has this, you know, um, element to her life that's extremely important, but it also, you know, it makes her unique within that uh, kind of larger, bland setting. What do you this desire to self-identify and express or expose or indicate to other people your difference. I, I really like that. I, I think she says later something about if she's in a huge class and she's the only one that that she's really, I think I mean, something about, 
um, that she does stand out, that she's not just another student, but she's kind of um, asserting herself as, as different and that she's her own person, that she's not in a way going to be like everyone else who knows who she is and just showing it. And she's very proud of it. Um, I thought that was really nice. Uh, it's kind of a funny term, but I've always heard it described as uh, bageling. 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 Huh. Yeah, which is um, in a in a you know large mixed community, mm -hmm. identifying yourself through your either religious or political beliefs or some way. Like it's bageling because it's traditionally a Jewish thing, right. and so like you identify yourself as Jewish to find other Jewish members within that uh -huh. amorphous group. Uh -huh. So I mean this could be, you know, the same sort of thing where she's identifying herself to kind of find her home community in another world or in another setting. Right, because it doesn't matter in she says it doesn't matter in a small class. She's not interested in doing this. But when she started to think about what it would mean to go into a very large group of people, that's when she started to think, maybe I want to self identify. Right? And so it's that sense of, you know, maybe it's a sense of worrying about being anonymous, right? You're sort of counteracting that anonymity with, or alienation with some kind of distinguishing mark. Um, you know, there's the sort of mix that, that's part of the story, right? But there's also a part of the story that sort of the feel the need to self-identify as different. And that's very interesting, right? Rather than the impulse to quote unquote assimilate or the impulse to not necessarily think about identity. Right? That we are just all humans and we are who we are. And, but this impulse, you know, I mean I just think about this in terms of my own kids who have to come, you know, come from kin kindergarten class and say, who are we? I don't know, you're a person, right? So <laughs> instead of saying, you know, well, where are we from? I was like, well, you know, we're as complicated where we're from. Yeah. So they want to know who they are because they're being asked, who are you? And my poor daughter was like, you know, our kindergarten teacher wants to take us to the computer lab and we have to put up these flags of all our, like, our background. You know, and so there's this push. <laughs> you know, as much as we were talking about the tribes, right, you have to have a tribe, you have to have a background, you have to have an identity, you can't just be. So part of it, I think, is the sense of needing to, to fit into a category. Is everyone following this? And that pressure, it's like, who are you? You know, I'm a human, right? <laughs> but somehow you have to fit that being human into a series of, of categories. And you can feel her, you know, comfort in that. Right? She finds comfort in that. Other people, you know, find comfort in that because it's, it's, it's something you can grasp. But it's a particular way of being in the world, where you feel this pressure to explain identity. Is everyone following her? So that's one reason that to wear the veil is, is this need to self-identify, this feeling of self-identification, which, you know, if you grow up, imagine you're growing up in a small town in Oman where everyone is pretty much like you. The need to self-identify in this way is totally different because you wake up, you grow up, you become a proper person, you would wear the hijab because that's what you do when you reach puberty. You don't do it because you want to signify to a world out there that you are Muslim, necessarily. You want to do it because you're Muslim. Is everyone seeing the difference in this? Okay. All right. Um, and, and so again, the, this, this so let's just continue what she, what she says. My non-Muslim friends are curious about what it feels like to wear the veil. They ask what it's like to be invisible. Now that's interesting. Because she's at the one time saying, I'm visibly stating who I am. And 
and yet her non-Muslim friends are saying, so you're invisible. So this is but in my experience, it can be just the opposite. If you're the only person in a room full of students wearing a Western dress, the point is that it's what wearing a veil feels like for the girl that is important, not what kind of veil it is or what she looks like. For me, it's important to have a kind of uniform appearance, which means that I don't draw attention to myself or my figure. At the same time, wearing the veil makes me feel special. It's a kind of badge of identity and a sign that my religion is important to me. Some of my friends at first had the impression that my family, my father or family, had a kind of rule that forced girls to dress like this at a certain age. But it was my decision and my choice for those reasons I've tried to explain. In some ways, it's also a custom, and I feel that it's a necessary part of becoming an adult woman. It's not so very different from deciding to wear a bra at a certain age or a wedding ring to show that you're married. Most girls I know wouldn't question either of those things. I would feel uncomfortable in tight clean clothes. So you can see she's like has a whole host of different ideas, right? One about not drawing attention to her body, at the same time signifying her tradition but not necessarily from her family, but some background. Okay, next person, Nadia. Nadia is different, right? And Nadia, soon to be university student. Here's Nadia. Nadia is a lower class, middle-aged woman who has lived in France with her husband and children for 10 years. She lives in an Arab migrant district and works in the textile she adopted the veil shortly after her first year in France when she started to work. So this is to say, in Algeria, she didn't wear the veil. Where she wears the veil is in France. I did not think to wear the veil as a younger woman at home in Algiers. It was not important then. At that time, my mother, aunts, and sisters wore Western style of clothes and did not cover their hair or face. Most women did not think about hijab 20 years ago. I mean, not even think about it because it's it was banned, but it just wasn't part of what people did, right? And the question is why? Why wasn't it part of what people did? Why wasn't it, do you think? They were part of the same community, they all knew that they had the same values and where they came from, and they were already known, I guess. Right, so they were part of a world where everyone knew each other or the basic expectations, and so there was no need to signify anything, possibly, right? Absolutely, what else? Yeah. Hard? Like a safer time. Safer time. What do you mean safer time? Like uh, it wasn't people like going out in the streets and like looking to harm others. Mm -hmm. It was just safer to be outside by yourself. Right, but that's what she feels, right? That there's, it's more secure. So there was no need to cover or feel protected behind a head or Yeah. So people are familiar, it's a safer time. It just, I mean, in part it just tells you that, you know, practices like veiling change, right? And it, it just taken for granted that you would do that. Your respect, you're a good person, and a good person didn't, you know, there are other ways of being modest, right? Like the Quran says, you cast your eyes down, you know, not maybe literally, but the idea is that you, you're you modest in other ways. Wearing the headscarf doesn't mean, you don't need that to signify anyway, right? Okay. Times have changed a lot of things in my life, and all Muslim women have had to face numerous changes, especially women like me who end up living in a Western country. In earlier days, it was as if the Muslim people were living in a dream. 
They were blind in that depth, not realizing how dangerous the world was becoming, how politicians and the wealthy classes were becoming greedy for money, corrupt and westernized. So what are you hearing here? Politics, right? This is a political statement about politicians. It's a statement about imperialism, right? Immorality and corruption had a serious impact on poor families like my own. She has a discourse of class, right? This is, she's, she's Algerian. She's coming from a socialist state, right? So the language of class and colonialism is everywhere, and that's what she's therefore drawing on. Um, but thankfully, we woke up after we saw what happened in Egypt and experienced the aftermath war, after of the war with Israel and other conflicts with the West. Then there is the big example of Iran and the people's struggle to throw out their corrupt ruler, rid the country of the ill effects of Western influences, and make a better society. Right? We talked about how Iran, the revolution was an incredible example for all these people. These things all had the result of making me more aware of the importance of Islam and my conduct and duty as a mother and wife for the future of the next generation. When my husband and I came to France, we faced a lot of hardship. When money was short because things did not turn out as we had expected, I had to find employment. There was no question that I would not wear a veil. It is difficult enough to live in a big foreign city without having the extra burden of being molested in the street because you're a woman. It is important to me to keep my appearance private and not to be stared at by strange men and foreigners. My husband was happy with my decision to take the veil. She continues. Again, in here, she continues and says, um, it is not frightening to walk through the streets for one thing, right? As, as we're saying. Being a hijab also makes it clear that the person is Muslim and that is important to me. Right, so she's saying it's important to me because of a politics, but it's also important to me because I feel safer. Right? And those are two different things. There, this is another person's response. Finally, Fatima, right? It's a widow in her late 70s, her late 70s who sells vegetables in Cairo. She was born in the city shortly after her parents moved there from a small village in Abu Dhabi. Do you remember Fatima? <clears throat> Why have young girls started to cover themselves in this new type of veil and dress like old women? <laughs> what is she saying? What is this? So Boston says, Why have young girls started to cover themselves in this new type of veil and dress like old women? I think this is just a trend, a fashion like any other. Times change and new fashions come to the fore, but this one is quite different from the kind of fashion that attracted girls when I was young. Fifty years ago, girls were most interested in the fabric, colors, and design, which would attract a possible husband's interest. We only thought about clothes in this sense. It wasn't that hijab and modesty were unimportant, it was just that girls were not so serious about it. And this is something that I heard in the field work all the time. The generational difference. Whereas, you know, older women would cover their hair, but they would really bulk and get aggravated with the university students and young women who would really cover. Right? Saying, why are they doing this? One old woman, she was with one, she said to me, My goodness, do they think that they're so beautiful? that they have to cover themselves so They're so vain. Like that, her interpretation was, they're so vain, and they think they're so beautiful that they have to cover themselves so no one can see them. All right, and she would be it. Right? So that, that tension is, okay, if you're just modest, and you, then that should be enough. Right? And so the impulse to be completely covered actually created this kind of generational tension and, and joke. And sort of impulse to be so literalist that, you know, it's uh, it. It wasn't that hijab and modesty weren't unimportant, it was just that girls were not so serious about it. Meaning that we took modesty for granted and did not associate a certain style of dress with the actual modesty of the person underneath the clothes. Right? So the idea was that you would be modest because of behavior, 
not modesty because of what you're wearing. You know the two different things. Of course, the world was a less dangerous place then, and girls faced fewer risks to honor and reputation because they spent more time at home. So many other things have changed in the ways that people live and the values they cherish, which makes wearing the veil attractive. Young men, in particular, have become addicted to foreign ways and place less importance on morals and modest behavior. It's not just girls who have to be honorable, but I can understand that girls are worried about facing the dangers of sitting streets without covering themselves. However, I do not think that this new veiling is a religious duty. A woman's modest conduct is more important than what she wears. The new veils are expensive. Next sentence. Right? So she goes from, and then she jumps to, they're expensive. And this is another thing that older women would say to me, to you know, the, the women, and there were not that many women in, in the town where I was in the world, but there were a few young university women who would not only cover their hair, but start also covering the face and covering hands. It was very, or, and wearing socks, right? And this was not so many, but there were some. And the, and the older women would not only stop and say, oh, they can get so beautiful, they can't see their face sometimes, but they would also say, oh, they don't do any agricultural work, right? Their hand, they're so sensitive. You know, they're wearing their gloves, they never take their gloves off to like, do any dishes or go in the field and, you know, do some actual work, right? So there's this tension that, that is not only about um, a political thing in that sense. Um, However, a woman's modest conduct is more important than what she wears. The new veils are expensive. I could not afford to buy them for my daughters. They have to be satisfied with the peasant women's scarves, which just cover the hair. Does this endanger their modesty? Rubbish. I tell them when they raise the issue of their new veil, hijab is not about any one type of dress. It's about your behavior and what's in your mind. So give that your greatest attention. Although I have this opinion about the new veil being a trend, which is not an essential part of Islam, I'm not against what it stands for if it means that society is becoming more concerned with morality and turning against some of the modern ways and Western values which started to take hold. It is important for the Arab people to rediscover their own traditions and take pride in themselves. Right? So now she's switching to a critique of this new veiling as a fashion to a shift to a critique of the expense of it, and then in support of the idea that this is political in another way, right? As, in, as a pan-national, pan-Arab phenomenon. Is everyone seeing the, the different points of entry here? Um, <clears throat> our ways of dressing can even be part of this. It seems very important when you see how the world has changed to the worst. We've become used to seeing Western women almost naked in our street. And if because of this, our women want to cover themselves in the new veil, right? She's saying, here we see where Western women nearly naked in the streets of Cairo. And if younger women want to veil more in reaction to that, more power to them. So very clear. Then it is a welcome protest against indecency and our overwhelming past interest in all things form. So this is an anti-colonial statement. Right? It's not, she's saying, it's explicitly not about religious modesty. If you want to talk about religious modesty, we can do that in many ways. But if you want to make a political statement about colonial, imperial expansion, then more power to you. Does everyone Seeing the different questions, comments on this? What do you think? Maybe thought of it this way? I think it I think there's a general Western idea I think. I mean, like they say, like she said about the invisible thing, you know, a lot of people, uh, they make comments about people that way, that way, that way. You know, they don't know there's so many different reasons. It's, it's not, it's not even just about religion, like you said, political, it's a political statement, it's a, 
Yeah, I just think it's so interesting too how the, the um, generations shift that it's like the old generation didn't think about it and then the new generation said, wait a minute, uh, there's something wrong here, like we're kind of losing our culture and we have to assert ourselves. That I just think that's nice so it's nice the way to look at it. Well, let's try to outline the different reasons, the different ways people are, at least these three examples, I think touch on a whole series of things. So, political, right? As a political, explicitly anti-Western political statement. So that would be one reason. And it's not everybody's reason, by any means. But it is one reason. What other reason? Pardon? Self-identification, partly political, partly just personal sense of needing an identity, right? As I said, my, my daughter or son comes home and they say, who are we? You know, and they're not satisfied with humans, right? They need something because they're being asked and called upon to do something, right? I say that human and that's not enough. And so that's the impulse, okay? So, Political, so the need for self identification mm -hmm. trends, fashion trends, absolutely, right? Some things are seen as beautiful or aesthetic or or appropriate as a trend. Yeah. Um, spiritual or even physical protection. Yeah. So spiritual protection and right or spiritual identification or a spiritual belief. This, you know, there's a, a, a genuine sense that this was right. And this is what one should do. And this is, and then fifth, so we have five so far. A sense of physical protection. And all of these, right, the, the, the sense of this need to self-identify, which is a very modern idea. Somehow we all have to have some identities that we're juggling to identify that in this room. You know, I'm female on this, on that, and this, right? That impulse, the impulse, the political impulse, anti-Western, the spiritual desire, the, the sense of physical protection, and the cultural sense, thank you, and the fact, right? So all of them, and one person can embody all of them, right? And you can see them jumping from one to the other. All right. So if new, if this veiling phenomenon, this sort of new veiling phenomenon, was um, popular and emerging in the 80s and 90s, and you know, continues to some extent today, I also asked you to read the first two chapters of Passionate Couple Right? Who just, in which, um, Matt Debbie describes sexual life. I mean, I didn't have you, I wish I could give you the whole book. It's pretty good. But you get a sense, right, of the changes of sexual life and social life in Taiwan between 2000 and 2007, right? She describes the difference about how she's So on the one hand, you have this new veiling phenomenon, 80s, 90s in particular, into the 2000s. But you also see post-2000 in Tehran, according to Mahdev and something else going on. What did you describe in Tehran? Like uh, some sort of cultural or sexual revolution yeah. amongst the amongst the youth, like both the upper class, middle class, and the class. So here we get in the 2000s, she describes in Tehran this youth, sex, what she calls a sexual revolution. Right? And you know, if you remember these these descriptions. Of, I mean, even if we start, um, so what, how does she describe the shift from 2000 to 2007? How does she bring that sexual revolution? She 
gives two examples where the ponytail involved, the police are involved. Right? These are like the, the morality police. Go around and make sure that you're where it means the right thing, or you're following the moral law of the district. And every, you know, every state has something that's different. Saudi Arabia had that too, right? What? Saudi Arabia? Yeah, yeah, Saudi, they call them a thou, right? And Saudi Arabia, they're called them a thou. Right, in Saudi Arabia, you all know the comitea. Comitea, you know what that sounds like? Committee, right? This is from France, comitea. Right? They're like, you know, the European, it's really interesting, right? It's the European influence on the morality of the Right? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, it's not, it doesn't come out of nothing, right? It comes out from a political state form that actually monitors morality, which, you know, all states have it, right? We have it too. It's just not in terms of the level of things. I mean, you can't walk out naked, right? You get the police saying that you're naked and not against morality. Like it's not, you can't walk down the street naked. Yeah. What? You can be naked in some very, very specific designated, but you can't walk across the street. Right? I mean, the police are beyond you in two seconds. And why? Because of morale. I mean, you cannot be naked. Right? So the question is what constitutes naked? Right? And so it's not as though we don't have morality laws. But it's but if you right. in the the right to walk Where? It's already about, yeah. It's not against the law. Yeah. Full nudity is against the law by uh, health code standards, but topless is acceptable. So that's interesting. So what do you make of that in terms of, do you think that's going to be a popular thing to do? <laughs> you think, yeah, see her thought, right? Yeah. I, I actually, I mean, I actually saw a woman walking down 34th Street just in Manhattan. In Manhattan. Uh, it was uh, the weirdest thing, and everyone was like, just shocked. She was like, oh, yeah, she I said, like, what? <laughs> and she was just, I mean, I guess she was making a statement. She was just walking Right, so she was making a political statement or social political statement, right? Exactly, yeah. It reminds me of a group in a Ukraine, Femen. Uh -huh. They're like totally not. Uh -huh. You know the group, right? Yeah. Femen? Femen? Yeah, oh, F E M E N. Uh -huh. In Ukraine. Uh -huh. They're like feminist group, basically. Uh -huh. they, are, they don't wear any clothes. Uh -huh. yeah. So, so they are in that revelation, too. Yeah. So it will be interesting, right? And let's, you know, one, whether this becomes popular or not. It'll be interesting to see what happens. It'll be also interesting to see what happens in terms of the rest of the United States and what New York and say, oh my goodness, they crazy. Right? <laughs> they have, they're totally immoral. Right? And it's like this, this idea of New York is this humanistic kind of crazy place where everything is legal. Or, so, if, so people have ideas and states have ideas about morale. Okay, so, what happens in Iran between 2000, the way she describes it, between her first trip in 2000 to her second trip in, in her late, another trip in 2007? What does she describe it? So what is the party? What happens? She goes to this party, right? In 2000. Yeah. Mm. What, what do you mean? In the party? In yeah. Okay. So, but what happened? That's right. So she goes to this, this is the opening scene. She's describing the situation. So in 2000, um, well, she goes to this party. Um, or is it in 2005? Well, she goes to this party. And uh, 
and the police break down the door, right? Or knock out the door. Right? She's at this party, she's relaxing, she walks in the house, party, she takes off her headscarf, someone <laughs> gets her a glass of wine, right, that they've got some kind of access to because it's illegal to be wrong. And the police come in and she and this guy jump out the window and like run to the run to the car. There's they're chased by the police. The guy that she's with telling her to hide, they catch up, spit in his face. You know, they're terrified. Right? She's really scared. She's really, really scared. What happens a number of years later? Yeah. They, they seem to become more lenient, and mm -hmm. she said some, one of the informants said something like, as long as we don't do anything like the day before our baby can go this holiday and stay out of the way, they they kind of are more lenient. Right. But not only if we don't do anything, not only if we don't do anything, um, oh, you know what it is? I know what the why this is. I know why you are all confused. It's because I want you to be alone. Oh, okay. right, so that's what we're So in the, um, but let's read this. Um, so in the prologue, which she didn't read, and that's why I'm asking you to remember something you can't remember. But the prologue, if you didn't read the prologue, and you're looking at me like what you're talking about, it's not something you didn't read this. Okay, so in the prologue, which I will now send to you, which you do not have, and that's my fault, um, she describes go driving, and in another situation where the police, um, well, there are two scenes, right? One scene is they're driving in a car, and a guy pulls up, and they're play she and her friend is turning on music really loud. Right, right, right. Right, and he throws her the the his phone number through the window, right? So they go hook up Okay. So there's that scene, and then there's the scene where the police. Is that the part that you read, or you're just looking at it now? That was there. I remember that oh, part. That was there. That was there. Okay, what about the part where the police c drives up to the car and the woman pulls up her skirt to show her legs and starts flirting? Okay, so this is another thing. So this is seven years later <laughs> where, where, you know, she's in this car and lots of things happen in cars. But there's a world of cars, right? There's a cultural world of cars driving. Right? Interaction. So the police drive up. She thinks she starts getting nervous, and her friend is driving. And suddenly pulls her skirt up and starts flirting with the police. And this woman is like, "What are you doing? You're, you're, you know, you're going to get us sent to jail and all this stuff." She's like, "No, no, no. Watch this." And so the police comes up and pulls up her skirt, and you know she starts batting her eyelashes at the police, and the police are like, "Hey, how's it going?" <laughs> And then he's like, what's wrong? And she starts chatting. Her friend starts chatting. And she's so nervous, she's like, not saying anything. And the police says, why is your friend so quiet? What's wrong with her? And then he tries to invite her to a party. Right. So anyway, here they are. Here's the police supposedly going to arrest them for morality issues. And clearly, there's a whole sexual revolution happening under Craig. There's this flirting, very explicit, nothing subtle under these all. Right? So politically, socially, she's packing in this moment. Something's happening among the youth in Tehran that they're defining as a sexual revolution. What does Matt Debbie make? What does she say the sexual revolution is about? What's going on? What are the different things? What are why the sexual revolution? What does the sexual revolution mean for me What does the sexual revolution mean? It just means, I mean, the way I take it was, it's like a form of like self-expression against, I guess, a form of self-expression, a form of freedom against being controlled. Like, you know, I would be so like, 
responsibility that should be able uh, so is it about self-expression? Is it about saying, I am a person and people need to have sex and this is, so I'm expressing what it means to be human? Is that what it is? Or what is it? I mean, I think you're against it, right? Yeah. I took it a lot as, I mean, due to the volume and the, it was a very urban area and there was a lot of, uh, there's a lot of different ideas and a lot of different communities coming together in this one thing. So it was kind of like a unifying theme amongst it of like different levels of uh, religious identity and different levels of cultural class all kind of mingling together and just kind of being human together as opposed to being like restricted by class and restricted by religious law. So it's a way of overcoming classism? Or is it about, we should call it uproar, right? Yeah. It's more like people want to determine their life rights or how they want to act in public. And it's because uh, the state is telling you to work one way to make your own choice. But do you think, just to play devil's advocate, do you think that if this is such a trend, people are making this way? And in the sense of, what kind of, is it about individual choice or is it a language of individual choice? Those are two different Right, so that we can say, I am doing this because I think it's important to be an individual and you know, individuals need to be able to express their true free will, right? The idea of America and free will. Or is it about that as a language to be part of a social movement? In other words, I use that language to, to, to oppose the state. But I'm part of something. I'm part of an entire, I mean, you know, these parties aren't just parties for being parties, she's suggesting, right? Cocaine and crack and alcohol, I mean, this isn't, that's, you know, it's one thing, they're doing this because they're going to have fun, and they're going to have a party. But that's not all that it is. It's about being against some laws, and against the state. Or an idea of what the state is. But are you following the distinction? Right, between me saying, all individuals, I really think that this is individual expression, and that's important, or, if we're all opposed to the state, and one way that we can oppose the state is to have a big party, are we really expressing our individual need to have a party, or are we participating in a revolution? And I think she's suggesting that people are participating in a revolution. They don't necessarily, sometimes they're conscious of it, and sometimes they're just I don't know if you buy that. You don't have to believe it. But that's part of what she said suggesting. Is that the doing having these parties is a way for people, or people are you know, participating in this world to oppose the state. And it could be some other way of taking the state. Right? You can do Occupy Wall Street. That's another way of opposing the state. Is everyone following? But in Iran, it's taking this form. What do you think? Or is it just people wanting to have a good time? Yeah. I think it's a combination of all of them. I think, I, I honest, what I honestly took it was that these people just want to have a good time and and and, and, due, and and due to due to like these these type of laws, they felt a sense of restriction, a sense of like not having you know self expression, not able to I don't know enjoy themselves. So I just felt like by having these parties, they're able to to do all of that to let loose, and then also they're still doing this despite the risk of you know getting caught or you know, mm -hmm. getting you know or, or, you know getting getting punished by their parents or their family. Like you risk, you risk all of that, but you're still you're still going ahead and doing it. And, and from that perspective, it's a revolution. Because if you're doing something and not doing the consequences of it, even if it fails, uh -huh. 
but at the same time, it's also it's what they want to do. Yeah. And they're also all young, so anytime you tell somebody young not to do something, that's exactly what they're going to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, like, I guess, like, let's say one could be part of this part, it's very good that. They have, like, some of their friends to start doing it. And then, they just, like, exponentially go higher because people would have that um, desire, but let's say everyone that you kept, like, like traditional clothing and stuff, but once they see a group of people growing in the size that do the opposite, they start to question, like, I have a choice between sticking with what I have and, like, doing what it does. So what do you make of these two different articles? I mean, so in one, the, one, the impulse is to be modest and to cover. And the other, you're saying, but just human desire. I, I, is there a human? Yeah. I feel like, I feel like, what they? I feel like it's exactly that. And when I read the two articles, that, that there is a choice that they make. You know, there, are, there are a lot of people that, that want to party, and want to do drugs, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And there are people who actually want to live a modest lifestyle, want to, you know, they want to live a and do you think that those choices are somehow individual choices that you grow up in a certain part of your life and you make? And they're both in response to the settings that they're in. And the people that live in more westernized cities are responding to the, you know, the the lack of moral law by adopting a personal moral identity. And the people that are in the restrictive city or a restrictive culture are adopting a more liberal or western identity as response to that so it's directly it's directly political in both situations because it's related to how the cities themselves are organized and governed so you think in both situations they're oppositional mm -hmm. whether you know if you're in france and everyone to your view is wearing immodest clothes then you might want to wear modest clothes but if you're in Iran, where the law is to be modest, then the impulse is to go to party. Right? And so, but in, in neither of those are we saying that, so that's different from saying that individuals have an inherent desire to be one or the other. Right? And neither of those. That they're all, right? So that's, that's the other side. Because I think often when with a question of sexuality and women's morality and gender appear in discussions in the Middle East, the impulse is to say, one, women are oppressed, and two, that oppression is counter some inherent human need to do X, Y, Z, right? And I think in these contexts, too, Let's just put it as a hypothesis. What we're seeing is what what is inherent human desire. We see them in both people are responding to some social environment. In both, it's oppositional, and you might not agree with that, but it's not. You know, one is saying there is the impulse to be as modest, and the other is the impulse to have a part. Yeah. I don't think anyone has like a need one or the other, but just having like a choice of picking the degree of equality the scale mm -hmm. and how modest or how much they believe the thing. Mm -hmm. And doing your own thing. You have a few choices based on what other people are doing. So like, I feel like people don't like are going to know like I'm gonna do this. And you see other people that take a position to do like this. So that gets to the second point is the degree of choice. Right, so the one point, there's two point, there's two issues here. One is this questioning, like we're talking analytic theoretical question. One is a theoretical analytic question of the degree to which one imagines some inherent human desire to self-express, or is it a requirement to self-express, or is it a contextual relationship to sort of social political environment? So that's one issue. And then these are theoretical issues that people have written in philosophy. 
you know, like, what are we talking about? The second is this question of choice. You can speak of a language of choice, but once we start to unpack it, the question becomes, to what extent do we even think in choice terms? And to what extent do we actually have choices, or do we imagine that social pressures push us into one trend or fashion or view? At some point, there's a choice, right? There's a choice to get up in the morning and not go to the supposedly. But is that a choice? Right, is that a choice? I mean, if you get up in the morning and you put on your clothes and you walk outside, are you choosing to wear clothes and not be naked? What are you doing? Yeah. I feel like that's more of a subconscious like part of ideology. Yeah, it becomes taken for granted common sense. Right? It's not, you don't sit and think, oh my goodness, I'm going to wear a shirt today. Should I wear, I wake up in the morning, get up, should I wear a shirt today? In the summertime, it's a question. It's a question, especially for men, but that's the, that's the, that's the ideological point. And that's why this like topless women not being arrested is precisely for that, because for women, that's not a choice. I don't know how many women in here wake up in the morning and question whether they're gonna wear a shirt. Has anyone done that? This morning, I will not wear a shirt today. What? <laughs> what? I think maybe if you're staying home. Right, maybe if you're staying home. Exactly. But that would be like a second level decision, right? So the question of choice is very interesting because at what level, at what point do, are we making these choices? And these women that, that Helen Watson is interviewing are explicitly thinking about what they've done and talked about in the language of choice. So that's sort of asking the fact. Right? And the question is, can you, at what point are you making choices or thinking of the way are not very And I can tell you that you know, the young girls who grew up in the small town in Vermont where I did field work, they're not choosing to wear real or not real. That's not a choice. It's not, it's, you know, not because it's being imposed on them. But that's what we wear. Just like we wear a shirt, they're going to put a, a headscarf over their heads when they do the baby because that's modesty. Otherwise, they would feel naked. Just like most women in New York, maybe a few, will make it an ideological point and not wear a shirt. But they would feel naked, not with their headscarf. But there will be a choice about some other parts of it. You wear a full day, you wear the gloves, you wear those are choices, and that's when it becomes a thing. Everyone? So, we'll continue.